to share with us uh, some details about um, how you joined the service. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. I, I was not drafted. I enlisted in 1942. And where were you living at the time and why did you enlist? I was living in the town of Irvington and I had been pressing my parents for months to let me go. I'm an only son. And um, I enlisted in the city of Newark, and that's in New Jersey. Uh, and that was in uh, June, I'm sorry, July 1st, 1942. So what was going on at the time that made you want to enlist in the service? Uh, the war was pretty much in its early stages. America was not winning. Uh, I felt uh, always a deep obligation as a young man. I mean, I was young and uh, 19 at the time. And uh, I guess I, my maturity was <laughs> not all there, but nevertheless, it, I felt that I would wanted to go, not not what other people were doing. Were you in college at the time? No. I was an apprentice uh, with a firm in the city of Newark, uh, a tool maker. And, um, and at that point, I was not going to school. Uh, this was uh, in the early stages of the war, and uh, it was an opportunity to get that behind me. What um, what branches of the service did you select, and and why? I did. Every, I initially wanted to go into re, into the submarine force, but my understanding, uh, in retrospect, was that there were a lack of vessels at that time, and so I went in as a regular sailor, and I was um, I went from Newark to. Uh, New York, where I was in, uh, sworn in, and then uh, went on to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, which was a naval training station. And c can you recall uh, your very first days in the service and what that was like for you? Uh, it was exciting. <laughs> and, you know, being young, it was uh, a whole new adventure. I had no idea what was coming. Uh, there were, I joined a, a boot company in uh, Rhode Island, at company 439. And I guess there were a couple hundred men in that company. And uh, I had 30 days of training in Newport. and. Uh, we would get up at uh, five in the morning and run for about a mile. And then from that, on, that time on for the rest of the day into uh, like nine o'clock at night, you were in classes learning how to tie knots, how to do gun uh, loading and so forth. Uh, very busy. What were your instructors like? Tough. Yes, very tough. They were chief petty officers, no nonsense, a lot of no time to waste, and that was it. Do you remember any particular experiences of their toughness? I wouldn't want to use the language, <laughs> nor would I like to say what they said sometimes. It was quite, quite blunt, and uh, it, was, I, it was something I wasn't used to, but, uh, you know. Yeah, they were tough, but they were fair. And how did how did you manage to get through that experience? Your your training. I thought it was a good time. I made a lot of friends. Uh, superficial because you didn't carry them on. Uh, it was, a, but it was an intense period of of, of learning how to uh, do some things. And in thirty days, they don't have much time. So after those 30 days, then, then what happened? 
Well, the Navy tests you and determines what your uh, intelligent level, I guess, is. And I scored reasonably high. And so I went to school up in Wentworth Institute in Boston. And I went there from, uh, I guess it was August, in early August, to uh, the end of the year. Uh, it was a uh, mechanical training uh, session, not necessarily Navy, but uh, encompassed a lot of different uh, facets of uh, uh, work, uh, you know, from machine work to school, in, uh, wherever it was applicable. And um, it was an intense thing. He went to school from two o'clock in the afternoon till midnight. And I believe it was six days a week. And somewhere in there, I did have a day or two off, but most of it was in the school. And how long did that last before? And were you shipped overseas? No, uh, at that point when I, I completed um, the schooling and I, I, and I came out of there, from, I, my ratings had been as initially when I went in was an apprentice seaman, and I became a fireman third when I went to um, Wentworth Institute, and I became a second class petty officer, which today is remarkable. Uh, I really didn't know very much, and um, I became now a second petty officer, class petty officer, which is a, is a substan substantial jump. And uh, I, of course, then was sent from um, Boston, where the school was, up to um, Portland, Maine, where I went aboard the uh, repair ship Danabola as a station ship. And uh, they didn't have enough accommodations, so they used to put us ashore in uh, Fort McKinley Island. And so uh, we would shuttle back and forth and uh, do guard duty and everything under the sun. Where there. is that? Where is Fort McKinley? In, Port, in Casco Bay, Maine. Uh, the, I got sick while I was there. I got German measles. <laughs> and for about two weeks I spent uh, aboard the USS Relief, uh, which incidentally showed up in my papers. Um, and then I went back to the Danapola uh, and then was immediately transferred to Philadelphia uh, to become part of the staging crew for the USS Delta, an AR-9. And uh, from some point in January, I guess it was, because having been in the hospital and getting out, so it must have been uh, late January when I came down to Philadelphia and uh, in Philadelphia we loaded ship. This is a vessel that had uh, been prepared to become a repair ship uh, and its intent was to be an amphibious craft repair and um, we loaded 24 hours a day so the crew was constantly on a move uh, loading ship. It was uh, intense. And uh, on March the 3rd of 1943, we uh, set sail and uh, we went down the uh, Delaware River and then out off the Jersey coast, which is always interesting because this is a really untrained crew. Uh, they had gunnery practice as we shaped up to join a convoy. And uh, that was about the only training these fellas got, or I got. And uh, the ship, meanwhile, is loaded to the hill with spare parts and all kinds of things. There was no space left. And uh, then we set sail and we joined a convoy of about 18 ships. Uh, mainly troop ships. We were the outer perimeter ship and we did have one or two attacks by subs uh, during that time. Uh, 
I always thought that a torpedo passed the bow of our ship. Uh, it didn't strike anybody. But I had been sleeping up there. <laughs> and when I came out, they told me that. I was impressed. <laughs> but uh, from that point on, we went through this. You know, uh, uh, I think uh, by the time we arrived in Oran was uh, maybe 10 days later. Uh, we went through the Strait of Gibraltar and up to Oran. And I remember distinctly pulling into Oran and looking out, out, and there were many ships in the harbor with holes in them. And that was my first indoctrination to uh, that war zone. There was no fighting in Oran at that time. The army had pushed on beyond that. Um, we. Uh, Orion. Orion is North Africa. Orion. I'm pronouncing it wrong there. Orion is a city in North Africa. Uh, that's Algeria. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed for maybe a week or two unloading in Orion and then moved over to a place called Marcel Kabir, which was a Navy, a French Navy. Uh, facility. Um, we worked there for quite a while up until June. We had some photo planes come over us. Our crew, which was very undisciplined at that point, proceeded to shoot our own rigging down. And, uh, you know, it was exciting. But the plane was about it went two or three miles up. And, uh, it, there was really no danger. Now, were you, you said you had been trained to, as an officer, so at that no, point, a petty, officer. a petty officer. What what does that mean in terms of your responsibility uh, at that time? If you're assigned, you have men under you, you assign those people work. And uh, you uh, spend a lot of time uh, perhaps working with the person that's below you. Because remember, we were pretty un, well untrained. And how much could I contribute to them? That was questionable. But uh, over time, yes, I learned a great deal. And I had petty officers, chief petty officers over me who were um, career people. And they were uh, very good. I was fortunate in having them. And uh, so it, I learned how to use a lot of machine tools, uh, do a lot of repair Type work, and uh, from them, uh, what I didn't know, they showed me. So your assignment at that time was to, to do be... repair work. Uh, whatever, if a vessel came in and had some problems with its engines or with, uh, any of its components, its elevators, anything that would fall within the mechanical range. Sometimes I made parts for these on machine tools, and sometimes I went directly on the vessel. Okay. And um, did you see combat during your time? In the when we moved from Oran in, I guess it was around uh, June, uh, the Germans were pretty much... Uh, confined to Cape Bon up in Tunisia. And there's a place called Berserti, Lake Berserti. The town of Berserti faces on the Mediterranean, but there's a channel that goes back into uh, Lake Berserti. And we came up in that area. We came under escort during that time. Uh, we had some incidents happen like uh, our ship broke down off Algiers, the town, the city, uh, but we were out at sea yet, and we had escorts, and they kept running around us as we had to work on our ship until we got it back on run, and there were a lot of crazy things that happened. Uh, and some of our sailors put meat hooks over the side <clears throat> and attracted sharks and then hauled them in and uh, collected the teeth, you know, sailors are sailors. And, uh, but it was a, a little bit tense because we were now at fully exposed. Um, 
but there were no no attack. Apparently, it was no vessels of the of the Germans in that area. So then we proceeded to go into Brzezerti, up the channel. Now, I don't. I remember gunfire, but I don't remember much about it. Um, we just went on in and anchored in Brzezerti, the lake itself, very close to the cliffs because we were a target ship. The Germans repeatedly on their radio uh, transmissions out of Rome named us, and uh, it would have been to their advantage to knock us out. And so now we were in uh, the zone itself. The Germans were still in that Cape Bond, but most of them had been made prisoner by them. And I would go ashore and do some work there, and that's probably where I picked up the gun. I don't even remember. And uh, um, it was uh, intense work. We worked seven days a week, and uh, they split us in crews of day and night. Now, uh, while we were there, we came under attack, and uh, the the Delta, which is an AR AR nine, is a repair ship. Uh, shot down, I think. Roughly four planes. At least they got credited for it. Uh, I can remember looking up and seeing the planes directly over me. And uh, it, there were intense times. Um, a funny thing happened while I was there. Uh, there was a, a pharmacist mate that was over in Brzezerti is is in a, this portion of the. Uh, area and then Karuba Air Base was directly behind it, uh, and he was a pharmacist uh, mate in the Karuba facility, and he sent me a note saying that he wanted to see me, so I had an opportunity to go ashore. I had to go uh, for rifle practice, and uh, while I was there, I asked permission and I went over and saw him. He said that. Uh, he had gotten my name off some church thing that had been sent to him, and when he identified my ship, he knew it was out there. So uh, uh, we had it was a nice speeding, and then I went back, and that night we were uh, attacked pretty severely. The ship alongside us got hit and went down, and apparently there was a lot of fire in the water. Uh, I guess from far off it looked like a lot, and. That following day, I went back in for more uh, of the uh, practice, and um, I saw him, and he said to me, my God, I thought you were dead, because I guess of the fire, the intensity, and uh, that, and I said, I laughingly said, no, it wasn't all that bad. It was kind of severe, yes. Uh, men were in the water. Uh, when this attack occurred, I was uh, at that time on board ship assigned to a forward repair. They split you up so that if the ship gets hit, that all of the techs that are together are all hit. And another fellow and I went up. They were looking for stretcher bearers while we left our station, which is bad. And we went up and we went over the side and lifted some of these people from the whale boats as they brought them in and brought them up. And uh, then once they were brought on deck, uh, other corps people came, uh, corpsmen, and we just went back to our station and nobody really knew about it. Were they terribly injured? Some of them were badly burned injured, and... yeah. Badly burned, yeah. And, you know, and, and um, I don't know how many people were killed or anything like that. There was no way for me to know. But that, that went on for a while, the, those kind of attacks. And uh, in, in, in retrospect, I didn't think it was all that bad. But some people might have. Were there casualties in your unit? Pardon? Were there casualties in your unit? Some. But mostly because what goes up must come down. And uh, I had... Uh, a, a good friend of mine, he uh, 
was up on the gun mounts. He was hit by a uh, fragments in his legs and his groin area. And he crawled down and went in my bunk. And when I came off general quarters, I found him. And then I got a corpsman down and um, he was then taken to dispensary. But, uh, and he spent some time in the uh, shore facility and then came back to the ship. He wasn't incapacitated. The shrapnel usually had very small fragments, you know. Uh, it must hurt pretty badly. I guess he, he, he had, yeah, he, I don't recall him, you know, he was more concerned about what happened to him, <laughs> you know, because where the area where he was hit was in the general area, and that was a big concern for him. Okay. Um, oh, you you were awarded medals or, and and yeah, citations. I have, Can uh, you tell us about that? I have uh, the usual medals. I mean, good conduct, the American Defense Ribbon, uh, ribbon for um, Europe, the African thing, and uh, something else. I guess I I'd have to go look. <laughs> You know, I, that sounds terrible, but I just haven't spent a lot of time looking at those things. How did you earn these medals? Do you recall Everybody the experiences? Got you just had to be there. I I, I have on the for the European one because uh, we uh, the ship was involved with uh, operations uh, for the four different landings that occurred out there. Uh, you know. Uh, we were in Brazerti, and from Brazerti, we now started to uh, get involved with uh, the campaign. I, you know, I, there was something that did happen when I was, uh, I told you I went over to Caruba, which is the air base, and at the time, I remember looking at a, a, in at a hangar, and in the hangar were all these wooden uh, caskets, and I knew then that we were there was an anticipation that we were going to be involved in a, a or the people that were around us would be involved at a great deal. That must have been a pretty sobering sight. Mm, he, some of my friends were a little bit stupid. They wrote their names on them. <laughs> I didn't do that. Uh, but uh, that's typical. You know, these are young men. And uh, they really didn't worry about life as much as people would think and I didn't so uh, you know and uh, we worked a great deal in that area that was our primary function uh, the craft the landing craft would come up alongside of us uh, and we'd do whatever had to be done to keep them running and, and in operation and then when I remember the day that the Galea landings occurred in Sicily in the morning or, or maybe even prior I remember LCVPs loaded with troops and gear leaving out. What's an LCVP? Uh, a landing craft. Uh, um, uh, L LSTs were there and they were moving out and uh, our, our effort would be to support them in that if they had problems. Well, after the landings, they came back and some of them had been hit. And uh, you knew it was severe because you could find uh, body parts on the, uh, on the elevator shafts and stuff like that. So, you know, that was our primary function. And uh, once Sicily was uh, occupied, we moved up. And we went to Palermo, um, and we uh, in Palermo uh, we did uh, we've been out there now for a while. So they put the ship into the, there was a dry dock in Navy dry dry dock at Palermo. Put our own ship in, scraped the hull, and uh, re recoded it, and uh, kept it back out. Um, Meanwhile, he began to stage up to go to Salerno, 
and again we were involved in some of that. Sometimes we were sent ashore to participate in their practices and whatnot of, of landing uh, to make sure the craft would continue to run. But what happens is the boats get in there and sometimes they suck up sand and then get choked up and you have to clean that up. But it, and it was again the seven days a week you're working around the clock. Uh, we didn't have we had some alerts, but no real attacks through that period. Um, the Slurno operation, uh, as you probably have read, was a tough one. They ran into the Germans uh, right in the beach area. Uh, the it, it, casualties must have been very high, but uh, they succeeded, and then they moved north toward Naples, and once they occupied Naples, we moved to Naples. And uh, I can recall going into Naples har Harbor, and there were many ships that were down, and we anchored in, and uh, uh, with our stern face and the, the, the jetty, but our bow out, and every day when we jacked our engines over, that's when you turn your props over so they don't settle in, a body would come to the surface. So there was a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, the troops, uh, it's amazing, but uh, Army people suffer a lot. And whenever we had a chance, we would bring them aboard and they'd take a shower aboard ship and they'd eat our food. And our commissary steward was very angry about it because he felt it was going to deprive the ship of food. Well. Some of our people might have bailed themselves of a truck full of food and and uh, to keep him quiet. And it was an, there were things that went on that I'm sure if the officers up above knew about, they would have flipped. But uh, that's uh, these were Americans. I mean, you, you were interested in them. Uh, uh, you know, we didn't have an awful lot of free time. Uh, if you were sure, you were sure because you had a job to do. And uh, I went over, there was a uh, military hospital in what used to be uh, Mussolini had set up for uh, oh, some kind of World's Fair in the Naples area. And they had taken over those facilities and used them for a uh, hospital. And we went in there and uh, to visit some of the troop people that we had. Some we had known, some we didn't, you know, just to let them know that, and we'd bring them cigarettes, butts, or whatever we had. Mm. Um, then after some period of time in Naples, the staging for Anzio occurred. Okay, now, this is going over a couple of years, you know. I mean, we were out there for, I was out there for 28 months. And um, the Anzio operation was pretty quiet. Uh, and, and I went up there myself and uh, I found it to be, you know, but the first day after that, it wasn't so good. And the Germans moved back up and those people that stayed there were caught in a, in a pretty, t pretty tough situation. And then as time went along, uh, the uh, invasion went up in England there to, into Normandy, and now the government, I guess, felt uh, or the military people felt they had to have another operation, so they set up the invasion of South France, and that we participated in. Uh, our particular units went in at uh, Caen, and uh, it was very reasonably quiet. Uh, the Germans were in retreat, so that the war was now turning down. And we were set to go back home, but our relief ship broke down. And then, so they transferred us back to Oran. And then Oran, uh, uh, by selection, I don't know what the process was, but I was then assigned to go back 
home. And I was about 28 months out there. Uh, I returned to the United States on the uh, General Brooks, which had a lot of wounded on board um, and a, a number of sailors who were being rotated back uh, for assignment. Uh, it was a very quiet trip. There was no, it was still in convoy because the war was still on, but it was winding down. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, your experiences during uh, during the war when you were before you headed home. Um, uh, things about, I guess, for lack of a better word, your the lifestyle and what what life what your daily life was like. In other words. Were you able to stay in touch with your family during this time? Communications were very limited. You want to know what, how we communicated? Um, they had a uh, email or, or it was a photo that they would make of your letters, and that letter would go back by, I guess, uh, plane. And uh, I, in fact, I might even have a copy of one here. Um, Mail was about, I don't want to, it varied, depending on where we were. Uh, sometimes it was six to eight weeks, maybe, before you would hear back. Uh, and I guess in a return letter. Uh, I, I didn't write a great deal. I uh, would write maybe once in a week. Uh, uh, I was... You're, you're working all the time, and you're physically tired. I mean, um, particularly during that period in uh, North, the, the in the uh, Reserti area when we were under attack. I mean, if you were working all day, you were up half of the night, right? Because uh, you got more than one ta attack in a given evening. They would come in usually around 11 o'clock at night and come in around four in the morning. Did you hear from your folks a fair amount though? Yeah, my mother and father wrote to me and uh, my girlfriend, I had a girlfriend that I had met in high school and uh, who I eventually married. But um, yeah, we did. But again, it was a stretched out thing. Um, not rapid like you have today. Uh, they're more fortunate they can communicate even with a phone. Uh, but it was a. Uh, we were pleased to get the mail. Uh, newspapers were very old, and when you got a newspaper, everybody read the same newspaper. Uh, how did you? How did you stay informed about what was going on in the war? <laughs> I think once in a while they put a bulletin out on board ship. And we knew about that. I don't recall um, too much uh, in a way. We knew that war was going on. We didn't know how the Pacific was doing as much as people back home did. Uh, we knew our own area because we're there. Uh, but uh, and I don't recall a good deal. The Stars and Stripes, which was circulated in I don't know how many copies we ever got, but it probably was shredded by the time. I, but I remember reading it, you know. What about entertainment? Was there any? We always see these old newsreels. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, I understood that uh, uh, Bob Hope came in the area of Brazerti at one time, um, but uh, not by us. Uh, no. Incidentally, he had a bubonic outbreak when I was up in Brazerti, and they gave us shots that were 40% effective, and we were told, do not enter any of the buildings, and we would be over in a, in a town, but we didn't enter the building. And uh, I under, my understanding was that there were a number of people that died, uh, but uh, we knew about that, and Disease was there. I mean, you know, this, this is a, not, a, not, not like uh, here, you know. It was a very poor country. But you had your own medical um, personnel. Oh, yeah. No, we had doctors on board the ship. 
um, because of the nature uh, we serviced everybody who came our ship there. How many um, people were on on the ship? A thousand. A thousand, huge. Yeah. I have two photographs that are uh, in the other room. You okay. can have. We'll do that after. Yeah, after we complete you know, the. So you know what the ship looked like. It was, a, it was not like a cruiser or something like. We had a lot of guns, but they were defense guns. I mean, we had twenty millimeter, and we had quad forties, and we had one point ones and uh, five inch, uh, you know, and three inch mounts. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a considerable amount of armament. And how did you, you showed us the belt um, from a, a German soldier. How did that happen? How did you get oh, that? I was, I think I was, um, and here I'm kind of, I guess I'm getting seen up, but uh, I, I think he was among about maybe a couple hundred prisoners. And I I was walking on the road. And where is this? In, in um, It was near Karuba, because I was over there for work detail. Um, what happened is when planes got shot down, they would send crews over to take pieces off them, and they were packaged and shipped back home for analysis. Uh, and it was during that point that I ran across this group. And... Uh, they were just sort of lounging around. I, they had been moved along, and I think they were waiting to load them to some place. And uh, I just came up on them, and, and, the, and the, the army was concerned because there had been people who got hurt. Germans would flip a grenade out, you know, and they said, be careful. Well, this guy was just standing there. He was a young man, and uh, he looked tired, and, uh, and I said, I had cigarettes in my hand, and I, I said to him, well, I want a cigarette, and he said, sure. And uh, in German, I, and I don't talk German, and he dunked on, dunked on. And, uh, and then he said to me, here's my belt. And, and I said, here's a cigarette, because I wasn't, I, and it was nothing it was great, you know. But, uh, and I threw in my stuff, and forgot about it for quite a while, but I use it now to show kids that these people weren't all animals. Uh, certainly they were dangerous, but, uh, you know, they're people. My mother was German. My mother came as a young woman to New York, uh, about six years old. I'm sure the feelings that were in her mind when I, when I, and incidentally, I enlisted to fight the Japs, <laughs> not to, to go to Germany. Yeah. So, uh, really, that's how it all came about. Well, that's interesting. Before I so rudely interrupted you, um, you were talking about coming home. Oh, yeah. What was that like? When we came into New York Harbor, coming over, it was just an ordinary run. We did, the ship was fully crowded because uh, you had a lot of wounded on board. I had to work on that ship because their some of their uh, equipment broke down, and they found out I was there, and uh, they knew from the roster. And I, I worked on their uh, disposal units for storage and that. And uh, but other than that, uh, the men, the, the wounded were off by themselves, he didn't bother them. Uh, but as we came into New York Harbor, which is, and I told my wife about this, the, uh, as we came up that, I guess it's a narrows, the people were on the shore. And even now it makes me, uh, it was, <clears throat> It was impressive, and everybody went to one side of the ship. The ship was like leaning over, and uh, here these people are waving and tooting horns and that as we came up the channel. 
we were not the only ship. There were a number of vessels. But that was good. When was that? Pardon? When, when was that? That was in 1945, just before the war ended. Uh, they brought us in, and they brought us up to one of the piers, I think it was 96. And they offloaded the wounded first, and then allowed us to leave. And there were a number of sailors that were being returned. Uh, and the, the Red Cross was there with coffee and donuts, and, uh, and the guards were saying, shut up, don't talk. They can't talk to you. You can't talk to them. So we just said thanks. And they loaded us on a ferry boat. They realized we came from a war zone. Okay. And I think they were concerned about how much we would say. Uh, they loaded us on a ferry boat and ran us across the Oboken. And between lines of troops, I felt like a, well, I'm, I'm not sure what. And they put us on, on trains, and they drew the blinds and shot us under the river and took us over to Lido Beach, Long Island. This is a Navy unit. And uh, in Lido Beach, uh, we landed in there about, uh, that it was a receiving barrack. Uh, we landed in there about 3 o'clock in the morning. And we hadn't eaten all day other than the donuts that we picked up. And they fed us uh, chili con carne and rice. <laughs> and uh, it was good. <laughs> and they wouldn't let us call home or talk to anybody for a couple of days. And then finally they said you can make phone calls home. And that was the first of my family knew that I had returned. Do you remember that conversation? No. I, I just don't remember that. Um. Then I was, uh, I think, I went on leave. I got leave, I believe, uh, I'm not sure how many days. Uh, I don't think it was 30. It was, uh, but, and then I had to report to um, Philadelphia uh, Naval Barracks. I'm here in vague because the war went over and while I was in Philly. VE Day came about. I didn't have, I wasn't involved in any of this thing in, in town at the time. I was, I don't really recall what was going on here at that point. I, and uh, I know it was over, and uh, at least for Europe, but I was already given orders to go down to Virginia, to a place called Camp Perry, Virginia, Advanced Base Training Command. I was to prepare to go to Japan. So the war wasn't over for me. I um, reported in there, and uh, now I had a totally different life. I was almost like the Army. I learned to drive trucks and to move prime equipment and uh, train people about landing craft and, and that sort of thing because the uh, this it, we would have been part of the logistic force that uh, eventually would go into Japan. Uh, now things moved along very rapidly. Uh, incidentally, during that time, I can remember there was still segregation in the military, and uh, although on on the ships we had stewards and that, but they were kept separate from the crew. They, stewards on, on board ship fed the, the uh, officers and that sort of thing. And, uh, and but in Camp Perry. Should we stop for a minute? Uh, my wife will answer. Okay. In Camp Perry, um, there were black sailors, all right? And they, but they were segregated and they, we were training them to do logistics work. There was no integration. I, there was one uh, 
uh, white officer and myself, uh, and the rest were all black. But I didn't live with them. I lived in my own barracks. And, uh, and I remember there was some friction going on extensively, uh, petty, petty things. Uh, uh, and uh, at times, petty officers are, are usually put on uh, SP duties, short patrol duties, stuff like that. And within the base, you became a part of the uh, police. But it was a separate thing that you would do at the time that they assigned you. So and we had to exercise some control on the situations that occurred, which were petty, really. And, uh, but at that time, it was not integrated. So situations between the black um, military and the white? Yeah, yeah there was the conflicts. Okay. But petty stuff, uh, like in the mess hall, I don't know why, but they said, I'd get a call that they were refusing to take their trays and empty them. You know, well, you come down here and you say to the guy, the first guy out, you said, go back and get your tray. And if he gave you a lot of static, you arrested them and plunked them into a data wagon and took them away. You know, but you had to exercise control, but there was no violence. Uh, other than that, and the me the people that were feeding you were German prisoners. They were the mess cooks. Uh, they were the uh, the uh, people that uh, uh, served the food. Now, why the, all this occurred, I'm not sure. Maybe there was resentment on the part of the blacks to the, to the uh, Germans. I don't know, uh, but it, it, nevertheless, somebody had to exercise control. And it wasn't one of my best moments, I'll tell you. But, uh, no, that was the only experience I had at that time. And then when the war was over, Harry Truman, of course, dropped the bomb. And I, and I really appreciate that man beyond belief. He uh, took that responsibility. He, he made a very courageous decision, and he had to take it to his grave. And uh, I, I, yeah. So you, did you ever get to Japan or no? No. My vessel, incidentally, the Delta, followed me home. It's about a week or two later. I could have come back on her. And uh, they went on to Pacific and they went to Japan. Okay. Uh, I only know that because I had friends that were born. Now, I understand that you also served in the Kore during the Korean War. Yeah. Uh, so. The, there's a gap of time here. Right. Uh, you know, when I came home from the war, one of my sons asked me, what would you do when you came home? Yeah, I had a lot of points, and I was discharged early on, what, October, I think it was. Yeah, October Of 45. 1st. Yeah, 45, from the bomb was dropped in August and October I was out and uh, I came home and I reported back to the company that I worked for and I went back to my apprenticeship and I went to school at night. I uh, had apparently I had missed taking two courses and I went to the night school at high school and finished the two courses up and then went into New York College of Engineering. Uh, at night and continued on daytime. Was that through the GI Bill? Yeah. And I continued to go to school at night, but I worked during the day as an apprentice and I finished my apprenticeship as a tool dye maker and then continued to go to school. But then, you know, things change. You know, you do it. And I got married after, oh, I guess it would have been 46, 45. And uh, then I, I was building my life, really. And my wife and I really wanted a house. So I said, okay, I've been getting letters from the Navy Department. Would I consider coming to, back into the 3rd Naval District? And, and, and uh, you know, they had reserve units. 
So I agreed to go back in January of 1950, okay? Because I wanted that extra income to purchase a house. And we bought the house. The house was being built when the Korean War broke out. And I was at work at Bell Laboratory. And my wife called me up and said that she had gotten either a letter or a telegram saying that I had been put on an immediate recall. I had, um, my, my background in the Navy, of course, is technical, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't actually go until, our, I guess it was November. I, in October, I got, I had to go to New York and the Navy, uh, examined me and said, oh, you're fit for duty. And uh, I flew up to Boston uh, on November 4. Meanwhile, we ju I just moved my family into this brand new house and I had to leave, right? So I think I had about three days. Uh, we had one youngster. My wife was a very courageous lady. Uh, but so it was tough. Uh, I got paid three hundred and fifteen dollars a month. Three hundred dollars I sent home. Fifteen dollars I kept. And uh, I joined the Caloosahatchee in Boston. Now the Caloosahatchee apparently had come out of mothballs, and so a lot of things had to be fixed. And I walked aboard that ship in a rainy night in, in November, and it. The chief warrant officer met me at the deck and he said, boy, are we glad to see you. And I said, I'm not glad to see you. <laughs> but anyway, it was uh, that kind of thing. And I wore, had a lot of work to do. And uh, then uh, I guess shortly after that, uh, we went to sea and we operated as a fleet tanker. And we went to South America and places like that. And I didn't go home for periods of time. Uh, whenever we did come in, our home port was Newport, I would endeavor to get home. Um, so, uh, but then we went overseas, and I'm trying to remember when we actually left, and we joined the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. Strange thing happened. When we approached the Mediterranean area, I got called in, and the rest of the crew did too, to fill out a last will and testament. Never had that happen to me before. We were a tanker with a lot of uh, potential gasoline and all that stuff on board, and you were now faced with the Russians, and the Russians were there, and they were there all the time. We joined the Sixth Fleet, and if we moved up to the Dardanelles, the, the Russians were nearby. If we moved to Crete, the Russians were there. If we uh, came back to Naples, which are, was our home port, uh, they were outside the door, you know. So it was an interesting thing. These young men that are out there now are faced with a similar tense type situations, but there aren't Russians, you know. So, uh, but it went on like that for some period of time. And you know, it's a funny thing, I can remember dates from the war, but I can't remember dates very well from the Korean situation when I was in the Mediterranean. But after being out there, I think it was maybe six or seven months or eight months, um, it, somebody found out that I had been sent to the wrong ship. And they sent my wife a letter or, or a notification that I was returning to the United States. Well, I get this letter from my wife saying the Navy Department is notified of the return to state. I was up in Crete. Uh, these are the islands off Greece in uh, Sudabate Crete. And um, so I took it to a yeoman and I said, look, I got this letter. My wife said, I'm be in return to the States. And he said, we have to talk to the executive officer. So we talked to the executive officer and he told me, 
Oh yeah, I, he, he went through a big thing with the yeoman. I told you to bring me that file, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, he said, yes, you're going to be returned. I said, what? He said, well, we'll let you know. All right, so I, I sent a letter back to my wife that, you know, indeed I was supposed to return. And we got back to Naples, uh, I guess a couple of weeks later. And we pulled in Naples Harbor, and the ship was getting ready to pull out. And um, <laughs> they said to me, pack up your gear, you're leaving. An hour before the vessel pulled out. So I went ashore, took my gear and threw it in. You don't have a lot of stuff. And uh, I went ashore to hand me special order dispatch um, to go to Naples Airport. And I had a... They told me to provide transport to the airport. So I got up to the airport and uh, I walk in and I hand the guy, they threw somebody off of the plane and said, okay, you're going back to the States. And that was it. And the plane was a bucket seated aircraft, not a plush aircraft. And we flew from Naples Airport to Port Leote, North Africa. And we got in there about three in the morning. And they told me, oh, go to bed, go over one of the barracks. And about an hour and a half later, he waking me up and say, you're taking off for England. And uh, so I got on a plane and we flew to England and I landed in England. I don't even remember where. And uh, they had to do some work on the engine of the plane that now was a Matz's plane. And uh, I went ashore, when I was there in England, I went into uh, I, um, they allowed me to go out to a, a, a tea or crumpets or whatever it was. And I realized I didn't have any English currency. I had some American stuff. And uh, they said, oh, forget it. And they gave me tea, crumpets, or whatever it was. And then I boarded the plane, and there were a lot of uh, American uh, women and uh, children, uh, military personnel on the aircraft. And we flew from England to the Azores. And in the Azores, we went from the Azores to our gen ship. The plane had some problems with its engine. And uh, it was interesting. The guy kept leaning over me all night long, looking at the engine. And I said, how are we doing? He said, the oil holds out or something like that. But she flew along pretty well. And then I uh, got down to... Uh, Quonset Point, Rhode Island, I said, whoa, wait a minute. I have to go to Bayonne. I'm not going to go to Maryland. So I asked permission. They granted it. And I went up. I took a train from Quonset to Boston. And I went to the Fargo Barracks. And the Fargo Barracks said, well, you know, you're going to bunk here until we get this thing straightened out. And they gave me, finally, two days later, they gave me uh, tickets to take a train into New York. But they never told me how to get the Bayonne from New York. So I called my father up. And my father drove into New York and picked me up, I think it was four in the morning, and took me to Bayonne, and it was raining. They wouldn't let my father into the Bayonne Naval Base, so I floated from my father's car with my gear and I walked about a mile and a half with my gear out to the Mission Bay, which USS Mission Bay, which was a station ship and reported for duty. And then I stayed in Bayonne. But I, um, in Bayonne, I worked for the Bureau of Ships. Uh, and MR, which is my, my rating had been changed to the machinery repair was in need by the Bureau of Ships. They were having some difficulty with theft. People were stealing things off these mothball ships. And I could walk into a crew, uh, into a compartment and tell you what was in that compartment or what should be. So they were using me to figure that out. And uh, my understanding was that it were People were arrested, and uh, I did that for several months or more. 
Um, after that, I, and most people went home after a year. Mm -hmm. I went on two years. And there wasn't, there, it didn't look too good about being released. I don't know why. I guess they can hold you for a longer period. But um, I did two full years back in reserve. Now, how I got out was funny. I had developed a, I had apparently picked up parasite infection during a war. Parasites come in various shapes. They, they, one was that scary formicaris, which is like a, a worm, all right? But it can kill you. Yeah. And I had, my system was pretty well affected. And my family doctor found it, yeah. okay? And when they didn't move on it, he was in, a, 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 in reserve, an officer. He called them up and told them, and they transferred me to St. Albans Hospital. And I spent six weeks at St. Albans Hospital as a purge meal, my system of this. Fortunately, none of my family ever got it. You know, very, you can transmit. Yeah. And, uh, but I finally got St. Albans to discharge me when I agreed that I would uh, go to be tested by the VA for two years after. Uh, I could have had a disability. I didn't want it, and because I know many people who needed it, and I didn't need it, and so I went back home and resumed my life. And uh, other than that, I continued to work at Bell Laboratory. Uh, I uh, worked for them for thirty, almost thirty-six years. I guess. And I, um, and I was 64 when I left them. Uh, they had a, we were going through stimulation type thing. They offered me two years of salary. I took that and left them uh, in 1986. I was a group supervisor over uh, operational areas. And uh, that was it. That's great. I do have a few more sort of summary type questions for you. Okay. If you don't mind, you're no. doing okay? <laughs> no, that's right. I'm tearing up as well, so no. <laughs> both of us here. Um, <clears throat> after you got, got out of the service, uh, it sounds like you've stayed a little bit active with veterans organizations. Yeah. Ta tell us about the, that. I didn't join the VFW until I guess I was uh, in my 40s. And I became an adjutant for a post in New Jersey. Uh, and I did that for up until uh, we moved here. And uh, then I joined a post here. And that was uh, in two, year 2000. In July. So what what does that involve? Pardon? What sort of time commitment and activities are you involved in? Uh, up here, uh, it, when I was the adjutant down there, um, you kept the records, the books. Uh, you uh, were involved, in, and we we tried to get people to go to the VA hospital, which was in Lyons. Uh, to be treated for Agent Orange and stuff like that. And so we utilize the post funds for that sort of thing. Um, but the VFW is experiencing over these years a shrinking. It, not everybody joins the VFW. And uh, since you had to be an overseas vet, that limits the number of people. And uh, so that most posts are suffering contraction. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that the New Jersey Post joined another post after I left. And uh, up here, the post is uh, comprised of about regularly 15 people that might show up at a meeting, but it has about 100 membership. And uh, 
unless it gets more young people. Uh, I don't know. Of course, these young people are coming along. Maybe they'll be like me and they get in their 40s. They'll feel the, feel the need. Because what you do is if the veteran organization stays strong, then you assure the people who are uh, needing treatments in that and that the government allocates a sufficient amount of money to that sort of thing. I mean, it, it, what raised some considerable amount of anger recently was that somebody in the White House wanted to use a veteran who's have it service-connected disabilities to use their insurance. I mean, you, that stirred a bit of a hostility. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you cannot, I can I personally cannot trust the government to take care of those people unless the pressure is brought to bear through veterans organizations. And uh, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but that's... I think the country owes those people, particularly those who have lost limbs and who have lost eyesight and all the other things and have suffered uh, post-stress. Uh, you know, I never did and, uh, you know, I don't, and the minor thing that uh, the, the parasite infection, they took care of it. I mean, I didn't suffer anything catastrophic. Um, I do have a, a cup, just a couple more questions for you, Mr. Jewell. Um, these are kind of big, maybe philosophical questions, but um, how did your military experience influence your thinking about war in general, um, the military, and how did your military experience affect or inform your civilian life? Well, I'll tell you, I think it matured me. Uh, when you look at military experience, I thought my experience had been rather mild. I don't think it was overwhelming. People who served in the Army, for instance, uh, they're constantly under stress and they don't sleep in a in a reasonable situation. Uh, whereas on a ship, although you are confined and you certainly are at risk, um, you live in very confined quarters. I mean, I think my uh, rack in a ship was like uh, six feet long and there was maybe, if it was 18 inches space between me and the next individual and they were stacked up four high and there may be about uh, 200 men in the compartment. Well, that, you say, oh, that's terrible. But not like, I think, like the Army, because I saw what the Army did and how they they got hurt and, and uh, the severity of their situation. So, you know, I have always looked at that. The Air Force is a, as much of a gravy train, I think, as the Navy did. Uh, they probably would disagree. I, you know, particularly people who did bombing runs and things of that nature. But that's the way I feel about it. I, I don't, uh, you know, really uh, think uh, it, it, that part. Did it condition me immaturely? Yeah, it did. Uh, you know, because subsequent years uh, raising uh, my first wife died when my kids were 15. And I had five kids, and the youngest was five, and the oldest was 15. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to raise them, and there was no question in my mind. Uh, and I was fortunate. They were good. They worked hard. They did a lot of things that were right. Some of them weren't right, but uh, they nevertheless are, are remarkable people. And... Uh, I think a lot of it came from himself. Uh, but I, and I had my parents help me uh, and during those periods. Uh, my mother would come up and sit when I had to travel and stuff like that. Uh, but no, I, I think I was conditioned to 
except what came down the pike. I had grown up during the Depression years, too, which I never thought was a I, my parents suffered a lot during the Depression years. Uh, my dad lost his job. We were without. We lost home, car, everything. And uh, yet they resumed their lives and reestablished themselves. And I saw that. Uh, recently, I would talk to a high school class. And I told them I didn't feel even though it was a very severe period, I didn't feel that I was the prime. I don't like lentil soup because we had it too often. But, you know, that was the sort of thing. That, uh, that, but, you know, my parents were good to me, and uh, I, I just didn't feel I had been declined. So I, you're basically conditioned over life, and I think I came out with uh, reasonable, uh, stable. Did it help you in your career as well, do you think, your military experience and what you learned and yeah, how you I matured? So. As I, you know, I, I, I started in Bell Laboratories as a toolmaker, and I left there and joined the engineering department. And I've never finished my college degree. Uh, my wife died before, because it takes about eight years to complete your education at, at night, and North College Engineering is a very good school. It's not called that now. It's called New Jersey Technical Institute or something. But, uh, you know, and, and I moved uh, from an engineering position to a supervisory position to a, a group supervisory position. And, and I was able to earn a very good living. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think I'm more fortunate than most people. I really. Well, we appreciate your service, and thank you for you this You know, interview. some woman asked me something. She kept saying to me at a meeting I was at recently, oh, we thank you for your service. And I said, look, you don't need to thank me. I live here. It's my country. It's been my privilege. Thank you.